Building my own home. It's a significant milestone in life. But right after reaching the peak of happiness, my marriage started to crumble. Please listen to my story. I'm Emily, 30 years old. My family consists of my 35-year-old husband, John, and our 3-year-old daughter, Sarah. We finally decided to build our dream house. When I tell people this, they often respond with, wow, that sounds perfect, you must be so happy. Normally, that would be the case, but not for me. Lately, I've been plagued with worries about the house we're building and John's parents. The first step towards the collapse happened when we left Sarah with John's parents. Both of us work full-time, so we barely have any time during the weekdays. We spent our weekends visiting properties and discussing the house's design. Since Sarah would get bored and fussy while touring properties, we usually left her with my parents, who live nearby. However, one morning, I received a call saying that my father wasn't feeling well and needed to go to the hospital, so they couldn't take care of Sarah. There was nothing I could do, so I thought about cancelling our plans for the day. But then, John suggested. Why don't we leave her with my parents? Honestly, I don't get along well with John's parents. They believe that they don't need to hold back with their son's wife, since she's married into the family, they feel they can say whatever they want to her. What century are they living in? Besides, I felt uncomfortable asking them to suddenly take care of a three-year-old. But if we postponed our plans, the house's completion would also be delayed. After much deliberation, I decided that, just for today, it couldn't be helped, and we left Sarah with John's parents. As soon as our errands were done, I rushed over to John's parents' house with some expensive sweets as a gift. By the time we arrived in the evening, John's parents were in a good mood, possibly because of the gift. I thanked them politely and headed home with Sarah. On the way back, Sarah asked. Where's Granddad and Grandmom's room in the new house? What? Sarah, what are you talking about? Did Grandpa and Grandma ask you that? What did you say? I said I don't know. Sarah replied, then resumed talking to her stuffed penguin, as if the conversation had ended. Sarah calls my parents a grandpa and a grandma with different terms. So there's no mistaking that she was referring to John's parents. Maybe they were just curious if they'd have a room to stay in when they visit? At that time, that's what I assumed. Since then, John's parents have started visiting more frequently, often during evenings or holidays, when we're home. We currently live in a small, old apartment, saving up to buy our own house. Whenever John's parents come over, they make themselves comfortable on our couch or at the dining table and demand to see the plans for the house under construction. Before I can stop him, John eagerly brings out the plans and starts explaining everything to them. Why does he have to show them every little detail? It already irritates me that they keep coming over. Then, John's mom, Nancy, starts firing off questions one after another. Like it's a congressional testimony. But it's not John who has to answer, it's me. I can almost hear the speaker's voice somewhere in the background. Nancy, proceed. These blueprints. The kitchen's location is impractical. Please change it. Also, there aren't enough rooms. You should add more. As people get older, they often find having their own space more comfortable. And having only one child's room isn't enough if you have another child. How do you feel about the declining birth rate? Okay, I admit that last part was a lie. At least she hasn't grilled me on birth rate policies. Now it's my turn to answer. Emily, proceed. Well, after careful consideration with my husband and following the proper procedures with the contractor, the foundation work has already begun. Therefore, changing the layout is now impossible, so we kindly ask for your understanding. I answered that a bit angrily. Then she started asking about the furniture. 
The appliances? Nancy claims to be a home professional. I have many friends, and I've visited many homes and carefully observed various rooms. With my trained eye, I can easily tell if a room is comfortable and if the furniture has good taste. This house, these rooms are terrible. They'll drain your luck and make your work suffer. It's the worst. A professional, huh? She sure knows how to sting like a mosquito. Nancy was being so annoying that, half-jokingly, I said, why don't we turn it into a multi-generational home and split the costs? Before I could finish, John's parents, Travis and Nancy, were furious. Are you asking us to pay? How ungrateful! A multi-generational home. We hate that kind of distant, cold arrangement. That day, John's parents left in a huff. Good riddance. You're not my parents, and I owe you nothing in terms of respect. You're more like a peanuts than parents. That night, after putting Sarah to bed, John spoke to me with irritation. My parents mean well and are trying to give helpful advice. So don't be so cold to them. Cold? That's not my intention. But don't you think your parents are the ones being rude? They keep interfering with every little detail of our house. They're always trying to one-up me because I'm just the daughter-in-law. It's normal for parents to do that. It's awful of you to call their advice rude. You really don't understand people's feelings, do you? You should cool off and reflect on what you've done. With that, John turned his back to me and didn't say another word. Sure, they're your parents. But we have our own family. And it's not like we've received any financial help from them. They don't give us money, but they sure give us plenty of opinions. How is that not rude? John told me to cool off. But instead of cooling down, I got angrier at how unreasonable he was being, and I couldn't sleep that night. Despite everything that happened, the house was finally completed. Our family was excited to move in, and just as we were settling in, John said. My parents are moving in with us starting today. The bigger room upstairs will be for dad, and the smaller one for mom. Wait a minute. Where do you get off making decisions like that without asking? We had planned for one of those rooms to be Sarah's. I never agreed to them moving in. Besides, I bet Travis and Nancy will complain that those rooms aren't good enough, like they always do. They won't complain. They've already seen the rooms, so don't worry. Travis and Nancy have seen the rooms? When? The day before we went to see the house. Wait a minute. Let me confirm it. Did your parents come to see the house a day before our inspection? Yeah, they wanted to take a look, so I lent them the key I had. It's not a big deal, it's just looking. It's not like anything would be lost. John said dismissively, as if the conversation was over, and returned to the unfinished task of wiring the TV. Nothing would be lost? Actually, something has been lost. And quickly. I didn't want to look at John's face, so I left the unpacked kitchen boxes as they were and went upstairs. I closed the door, locked it, and tried to sort out the mess of confusion and anger in my head. I was genuinely relieved that I had put Sarah in daycare, using the unpacking as an excuse. Thanks to that, I can finally think clearly on my own. John's sudden declaration that his parents would move in with us completely drained any affection I had left for him and his parents. I don't want to spend another second with those people. But we've just made a huge purchase with this house. I need to stay calm and composed. I have to think carefully about what I should say and what I shouldn't. For the sake of Sarah's and my future. I stayed in the room, firmly resolving to gather my thoughts and waited for John's parents to arrive. 
Just as John had said, his parents arrived in the early afternoon, along with a truck loaded with their moving boxes. At least come out and greet us, for heaven's sake. No matters whatsoever. Oh, it's still such a mess. How slow can you be? After complaining for a while, John's parents confidently walked into our newly built home as if they owned the place. I listened carefully from upstairs, then stepped out of the room and headed toward the entrance. Travis, Nancy, I wasn't informed that you two would be moving in with us. My first words were shockingly cold, even to myself. Travis seemed offended by this and immediately began to blame me. I told John, that should be enough. No, it's not. I only heard from John this morning that you and Nancy plan to move in. And I have absolutely no intention of living with you too, especially after how rude you've been. What did you say? John said it was fine. Do you think you can go against your husband, even though you're just the wife? Exactly. Such a shameless wife. If you don't like it, Emily, why don't you just leave? I knew it. I've always felt that way, but now I'm certain that we're too different, and there's no way we can communicate effectively. While I was thinking about how to respond, John rushed over, looking panicked. What are you doing, Emily? Don't fight with my parents. Fight? This isn't a fight between equals. I'm being unilaterally insulted just because I'm the wife. And now, I'm being blamed by John as well. It hit me again, he's just like his parents. John, I can't live with your parents. Can't. Don't make this difficult for me. You're the wife, so you should obey your husband, right? Before I'm your wife, I'm a person. Do you really think you can force me to obey? Hearing our exchange, Travis raised his voice. We don't need a wife like that in our family. John agreed with Travis. Yeah, you're right. Maybe we should just get a divorce if you can't respect my parents. That's what I was waiting for. Fine. Let's get a divorce then. I said it clearly. John was the one who brought up divorce. I agreed. I silently prayed that the smartphone in my pocket had recorded this conversation perfectly. With that hope, I continued. Since we're going our separate ways, please return the $350,000 I lent you for the house immediately, John. What? John's parents let out a shocked and bewildered cry. John's face turned pale, almost ghostly white, as he looked at me. I took the time to carefully explain to John's clueless parents. I think there's been a misunderstanding. John didn't contribute a single penny to the cost of this house. This house was built entirely with my savings. That's because John, who has absolutely no sense of financial planning, didn't save anything at all. We both worked full-time, and we agreed to contribute equally to the household expenses, saving the rest in our respective accounts. But he spent his money recklessly and didn't save any of it. Hey, Emily, there's no need to go that far. It's all true. And yet, when it came time to buy the house, you insisted it be in your name. That's why I loaned you the money. I even have a promissory note, so you can't pretend this never happened. This can't be. Leaving John and his parents in stunned silence, I quickly packed up my valuables, clothes, and Sarah's favorite toys and clothes into a suitcase and a duffel bag. With Sarah's beloved penguin plushie tucked under my arm, I loaded everything into my small car and drove off. I said a brief farewell to the newly built house we had barely gotten to know. Then, I picked up Sarah from daycare and headed to my parents' house. My parents were quite shocked when I showed up suddenly, carrying so much luggage and dressed in casual clothes. I know this is sudden, and if it's too much trouble, I can go to a hotel. I said this hesitantly, but my parents quickly stopped me from leaving. 
I later found out that they were worried I might be planning to take Sarah away and do something drastic. In reality, it was the opposite. I had sworn to protect my daughter no matter what. I told my parents everything that had happened. Including my decision to leave John, who had no redeeming qualities, and my determination to raise Sarah on my own. My parents promised to support me fully and suggested that I live with them for a while. As someone with a job, I really appreciated the offer. That night, I wrote down everything that had happened between John, his parents, and me. I also saved the audio recordings from my phone of the conversations I had with John and his parents onto my computer and an external drive. Armed with this evidence, I used my paid leave and weekends to visit several law firms. I finally found a lawyer I could trust and officially hired him. As the busy days flew by, a week had passed since I fled from our new home. One day, after finishing work and leaving the office, I found someone waiting for me. It was John. I wanted to call him my ex-husband, but unfortunately, we were still legally married. I had nothing to say to John, but I was scared that he might do something if he lost his temper. So, I decided it would be better to be somewhere more public, so we went into a cafe together. Just in case, I made sure to turn on the recording function on my phone. I tried to stay as calm as possible and asked John a question. Is there something you want to talk about? Yeah, about the house. I'll transfer it to your name. In exchange, can we just call it even for the money? I'm sorry, but I don't want to live in that house anymore. Your parents stepped foot in it before we did, right? Why does something like that even matter? It matters to me, so no, it's not possible. I took a sip of my coffee and stared at John. His hair was sticking out in several places, as if he hadn't bothered to style it properly. A scruffy beard was growing on his chin, and his complexion wasn't looking great. He was wearing a suit, but his dress shirt was wrinkled and worn out, looking like it hadn't been ironed or taken to the cleaners. I didn't know what kind of life he was living, but he looked worn out. Please, Emily, I can pay back that much money so easily. You borrowed it knowing it was a lot of money, didn't you? I even suggested putting the house in both our names or just in my name, but you insisted, it's my house. It has to be in my name. That was your choice. That's because I thought I should be the head of the household. And about the divorce, I didn't mean it seriously. It was just a threat. Why did you take it seriously, Emily? I'm serious. I'm done with you, and I'm definitely getting a divorce. It's one thing if you're just unreliable, but with such rude parents attached to you, it's impossible. This can't be happening. Sarah is waiting, so if we're done here, I'm going home. Wait, I'm taking custody of Sarah. John's words made me feel uneasy. When I got back to my parents' house, I asked them to be careful and not let John take Sarah by force. A few days after John's visit, I received a call from Sarah's daycare saying that someone who looked like John's parents was there. I left work early and rushed to the daycare. Fortunately, I had informed the daycare in advance, so John's parents were kept waiting in a separate room and weren't allowed to see Sarah. When I entered the room where John's parents were, they immediately started yelling at me. Give us back our granddaughter, you greedy, a homewrecker. A homewrecker? What do you mean by that? I haven't destroyed anything. If you're not a homewrecker, then you're a scammer. You must have made your money by doing something shady. There's no way someone your age has that much money. No, the money I lent John was all mine. It was honestly earned. It's a combination of my own savings and the money my parents and grandmother gave me as a living inheritance. A living inheritance. That's right. 
They transferred the maximum amount allowed each year without incurring gift tax into an account in my name. The total amount, plus the money I got from selling stocks in my name and my savings, is what I used. So it was really Emily's money. Didn't you give John any living inheritance? You can still do it now, you know? Uh. Travis groaned and fell silent. John's parents were flashy, vain, and loved luxury above all else. They were a typical middle-class family with no passive income, so their savings were probably minimal. It was obvious that they had never even considered the idea of a living inheritance. I'm sorry, but I'm divorcing John. I'm taking custody of Sarah and raising her. Please don't come to the daycare anymore, it's disruptive. With that, I put Sarah in the car and quickly returned to my parents' house. Unfortunately, despite my warning, John and his parents came back several times after that. Each time they came, I tried to talk to them as calmly as possible and send them away, but it wasn't uncommon for them to grab my arm or hurl insults at me. I recorded all of these encounters on my smartphone. About a month after I fled the new house, I sent John a document through my lawyer, demanding repayment of the debt and agreement to the divorce. John mostly agreed but showed a willingness to fight over custody. However, when I mentioned that I would file for alimony if he did, he quickly quieted down. After all, I had plenty of evidence on my side. And he had no savings to cover any payments. It took some time, but I eventually secured the repayment of the money I had lent John, gained full custody of Sarah, and successfully finalized the divorce. The repayment of John's debt took longer than I expected. Because the sale of the new house didn't go as planned. At first, I thought John and his parents would move into the new house together, but they didn't. The reason was simple. Neither John nor his parents could afford to pay the $350,000 for the house. John had no savings to begin with, and even if his parents sold their old house, it wouldn't have been enough. In the end, the new house was put on the market for less than the purchase price, and after several price reductions, they finally found a buyer. John had to borrow money from the bank to cover the difference between the purchase and sale prices, as well as the selling fees. John, now without a house and saddled with debt, ended up living in his parents' dilapidated old home with Travis and Nancy. To make matters worse, John's divorced sister moved back in with her two sons. Her sons were in middle and high school. With six people crammed into a small, run-down house, it became infamous in the neighborhood for the daily shouting matches. Thankfully, that family never bothered us again. Given that they couldn't even pay child support, they had no reason to show their faces. For years have passed since then, and Sarah is now in the second grade. The two of us now live in a rented place near my parents' house. On the days I come home late, Sarah stays with my parents, and with their help, we enjoy our time together. I used to think it would be fine if it were just the two of us forever, but now I'm actually seeing someone. He's 36, divorced, and has a daughter in first grade. We met because we often ran into each other while picking up and dropping off our kids at daycare, and eventually, he asked me out. Recently, we've been going out as a group of four, including our daughters. If we build a house, it would be nice if all four of us had our own rooms, and maybe we could get a dog too. Sarah said this casually the other day, and it made my heart skip a beat. You see, that man proposed to me a while ago. Because of the kids, I asked him to wait for my answer, but deep down, I've already made up my mind. I walked over to Sarah, hugged her small back, and said, Yes, let's build another house. This time, we'll make sure everyone is happy, and we'll plan it together as a family.